Okay, it looks like we have a quorum and uh, it's uh, time to get started. So we're gonna call this one to order. I lost my agenda, here it is. Um, we're gonna start out with um, a grievance that's been filed by John Race and uh, James Cunningham from the Highway Department. Uh, and it's well, gotten to the level not, for the select board because this is to um, the best hear the grievance and, and uh, issue a decision. So uh, we'd like to start off with uh, allowing uh, John and uh, James to present their case. Do I, are they here? I have both of them. This is Corey. I have both of them on my computer at my house. Which one would you like to go first? Uh, can you have them call into our meeting? Uh, they're saying no, they're not able to. They are planning on just using my computer. What service are you using, Corey? I'm using my hotspot on my phone. So I believe there's actually a phone line they can call in on. That's absolutely true. On the agenda, there's a phone line, Corey, 929-436-2866. So they can call into our meeting. Neither one of them say they have a phone with them. So what are they using to connect to your computer? They're at my place. So they're sitting there with you? Well, they're not with me. Well, one of them is eight feet away and the other one is about 10 feet from the other one. All right, so let's start. Uh, let's have the first one listed. John explain what his grievance is. Excuse me, madam. I, I would, I'd love to just to step in for a second. My name's Sean McGottle. I'm the uh, bargaining agent and the uh, exclusive bargaining agent for this group uh, through IUP. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, this is a grievance hearing. It is a personnel matter. Uh, it is kind of unorthodox that we do those in open sessions, considering it is a personnel matter. Uh, the documents have been presented and forwarded to this committee, uh, which are pretty straightforward, pretty simple of what they are. Uh, this this grievance, I'll break down real simple so we don't waste a lot of people's time, is that is that this is bargaining unit so John, work. Sean, Sean, oh, hold up. Uh, let's just... I want to hear from John and James, since it's their grievance. And if they want to authorize you to speak for them, then I'm fine with that. But right now, what we have is the two individuals coming to us with a grievance, not the union. Yeah, but we are the exclusive bargaining agent. And if you look at the contract under Article 1, it's very clear that says we are the exclusive bargaining agent for this bargaining unit. Um, Yep, that, thank you. So and that John all, and claims, James, all claims by the employer, the, by the union, shall be brought forward. This John, is clearly a union. John, this, is, and this, is, all the John, way this is Adolfo, the town manager. If you continue to interrupt, I will have to mute you and can remove you from the meeting if you do not allow the select board chair to run the meeting. Adolfo, so what I'm asking you. for is for the two individuals that have filed the grievance, if they're speaking or if they want the union to speak for them. Union speak for me. And who's me? Uh, John Reyes. Okay. And there's another member, James. Union speaks to me, James Cunningham. And Corey, are you uh, having Sean speak for you as the local rep? You're or are you speaking? I'm going to let Sean speak for me as well. OK. 
Okay, so Sean, if you could just present the grievance that's been filed by the two town employees. Yeah, again, I'm gonna put on the record one more time uh, that clearly the union is the truth of bargaining agent here and in article three clearly states that the union shall present the written grievance to board of select within 10 days, um, which has been forwarded. Uh, we have served this grievance is a pretty straightforward grievance that's gone all the way through the process. Uh, it is in violation of section 402 F uh, which clearly start, talks about the membership. The members of this unit have had um, bargaining unit work, which was for snow removal, plowing, and this has been done by a supervisor, which has generated this grievance. Uh, the plowing and snowing of the town roads have been done and continue to be done by bargaining unit work, which is actually even referenced in another section of 301C, which is not in contention right now, which talks about inclement weather of when the town can actually change the shifts of the employees. Uh, the supervisor has admitted that he did do salting of roughly five miles of roadway without calling in the membership. And that's what the grievance is in a nutshell. This has been bargaining unit work uh, for us and will continue to be bargaining unit work. And that's the grievance in a nutshell. So Sean, uh, I'm sure as the union, for, so you're familiar with the job specs for employees of the town? I am very, very well aware of what the job duties are for this bargaining unit um, and okay, what so the exclusive bargaining unit. The examples of work for a highway equipment operator. Um, can you tell me what, what are the types of equipment that those folks operate in the activities? Uh, I believe it's spelled out in there, a lot of them, as far as what the additional responsibilities is in the wage section of the collective bargaining agreement that they talk about uh, motor grader, tractors, wheel excavators, or crawler dozers. I mean, that's in the contract of which that, the town. Yeah, the items that you're mentioning are just the ones for which the town will pay an extra dollar an hour if they're Correct. operated. So let me help you with this. Highway equipment operator, under examples of work, it says operates a variety of equipment from pickups, medium dump trucks, snow plows, and that they, underneath it, it also says operates equipment consistent with established public work methods and procedures for maintenance and snow removal. Would you agree with that? Correct. Okay, so then the highway superintendent job spec, I'm sure you're familiar with that, so I'll just go right to it. Examples of work, it says, operates all equipment when necessary to complete the mission. Would you agree with that? If that's what it says, I don't have that in front of me. So when they operate all the equipment to do the mission, the equipment has been spelled out as trucks, dump trucks, and whatnot well, for maintenance and snow removal. We have an operating superintendent, not just an office okay, superintendent. You'll, you'll agree, though, that the snow plowing is the job duties of the highway department. Of the entire department, right. Yes. The uh, therefore, highway therefore, operator and the superintendent. Therefore, the, the policy or the job description of your superintendent cannot supersede our collective bargaining agreement which clearly says bargaining unit employees shall be offered bargaining unit overtime first. Well, but I don't know that this was bargain was overtime, right? It was, we already had a superintendent out there working that just had to literally reach over and hit a switch to spread material in the back of his truck, which he is allowed to do because it's in his job spec while he was out inspecting. So I'm, I'm not understanding why. So first off, he's allowed to do it in his job spec. It is his job. And second off, aren't we talking about a public safety issue here? So his job is to do these activities needed for a safe highway. You're saying he should have just called in other employees which have a, an hour to respond to the garage 
to then figure out material, load material and respond. So for about an hour and a half, we would have that same condition as a known condition in the town, creating a liability, but we have a working superintendent, not a desk jockey. So I guess I'm, I'm not understanding why you feel that the right thing for him to do was to leave an unsafe situation when his job is to be able to operate equipment and maintain safe roads also. So is the superintendent contesting that this was a call that came in from a town resident saying it was unsafe and he was to show up to do that? Or was it he was driving the roads and seeing that it needed to be a little bit salted more and decided to do it? He was out doing, checking the roads. Madam, Madam Chair, if I may uh, share something with you, if, if it's, if it's uh, useful. It sounds to me like the union is um, attempting to um, override a section of the union contract, more specifically section 402 overtime, paragraph B, where it specifically states, the need to schedule overtime shall be determined by management. No employee shall work overtime or schedule another employee to work overtime without prior authorization of the town manager or town manager's designee. Um, in the case that is being made by the union, it is directly in contradiction to this specific item, which the union agreed to, which is stating that management determines when overtime is to be scheduled or when overtime is needed. Agreed. Um, that that's in the contract. Um, do we have any um, questions? from other board members on this? Uh, I, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, let me make sure I'm going down through the grievance packet here. Um, so it was Mr. Cunningham that saw Mr. Drury at four o'clock in the morning on the 21st of 2020, uh, 21st of December, 2020. Um, was Mr. Cunningham out at that time of the morning in the middle of the snowstorm expecting to be called in? Or how is it that he was out and just happened to come upon um, Mr. Drury? Sorry, Corey, do you want to answer that? Yes, he's coming to the computer. Yeah, I was, sit, I was in my house getting a cup of coffee and I looked out my window because I got a straight shot to the main street from where I live. And I saw him drive through with the Chevy and salt lights on and he was salting. Okay. And I... I the second question I have is that I see uh, information as provided by the town manager relative to the grievance committee meeting um, that was held where this, where this uh, grievance was discussed. And according to the minutes of that meeting, or at least the way they've been related to, uh, to we select board members, it says during the conversation, both Mr. Race and Mr. Cunningham agreed that Mr. Drury performed salting and or sanding of roadways. And Mr. Cunningham, without objection from the grievance committee, agreed that Mr. Drury performs these duties on a regular basis and are considered a part of his normal work. So how does that uh, statement that you, based on what I'm seeing here, agreed to um, during the grievance committee, how does that dovetail with your grievance? If, if you're saying that Mr. Drury routinely performs this work and then you're flipping it around and saying, but he was performing it when he shouldn't have been. And what's the, what's the story there? Uh, what, he did, what he did, he was doing Main Street, which is part of my roof. And uh, by all rights, he should have called me in because that, is my route and and he's supposedly doing the pack a lot.
Not sure, James, that that answered the question. No, it didn't. Um, the, the indication I see in the documents that we've been presented related to this greeting, to this grievance are that Mr. Drury routinely performed salting and sanding of roadways and that uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham agreed to that. And, it, and both Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Race said that he, he routinely performs these duties on a regular basis. Nothing was said about parking lots or time of day or roadways versus shoulders or anything like that it just and in his job description it it talks about his uh being able to and expected to participate in the operation of town equipment so i don't i don't quite get what the distinction is here I believe in the distinction in this grievance is that he has sanded and uh, plowed parking lots. He has never done the main roads. Okay. That has always been done and divided up amongst the employees and the bargaining unit work. And mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, gentlemen, please correct me. But Sean, that doesn't sound like what your members agreed to when they had the meeting. Well, they, they are right here on the phone that's saying that it was parking lots and that he was doing the main drags um, is from what the statement that So was. does anything in the union contract or in the job descriptions make the distinction between parking lots and roadways? There is nothing in the contract. It's been the practice of the parties okay. uh, for as long as these guys have been there. Yeah. So uh, help me understand this uh, James, in the uh, entire time you've been with the town of Randolph, uh, a superintendent of highways has never applied sand or done any operating of equipment on a town highway? Or you got to unmute for him to talk. He's, can you repeat that? He couldn't hear you. I want to know if uh, what he's saying to us is that in the time he's been working for the town of Randolph, a highway superintendent has never operated equipment, town equipment on a town highway, only in parking lots. No. You got to leave it on unmuted, Corey, so we can hear him. No. So you're telling me a superintendent has never operated town equipment on a town highway? I didn't say that. What I meant was they do operate them, but generally when we're in here, we're all busy and we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing. Hey, that's not helping me. So he was out that morning doing what he was supposed to be doing, right? Which is checking the roads and whatnot. And he applied product to the road because it was slippery. And so you're saying that that is a, something that he would do, but just not at four in the morning? That's what he's supposed to do if we're not out. If we're available to be out, there's no reason why he can't call us and tell us we need to come in and take care of our roots. So he would do it if you weren't out. If we are all out, that's our job is to tend to our roots. And yes, he does help us when we need him to help us. So it is normal for the highway superintendent to be out operating equipment to do maintenance and activities on town highways. Yes. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? I guess I would just also like to, because overtime is that issue here, 
Um, is it just the fact that it was four o'clock in the morning and outside of the traditional work day that this would constitute overtime? I suspect that's the case. I just want to clarify that. Yes, that yes. is the case. Okay. So if this was four o'clock in the afternoon, it wouldn't be overtime. Yes, it would. The highway department runs 7 to 3.30. Okay. Well, then if it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it wouldn't be overtime. Okay. But I think what we're hearing, Tom, is um, that... Yeah, I know the overtime is not the issue. The issue is that the... the um, I don't want to call it the right, but the, whether it's proper for the highway supervisor to have been doing this, um, even though it's in his job description that he is, that this is one of his duties and responsibilities, so. Well, but what I heard was that he does do this. Yeah. They don't like it that he did it at four in the morning, but it's okay if he does it at noon. And well, that's what I I'm kind of I, getting at here. I'm not, you know, he's out there. His job is to be out there at four in the morning. His job is to be checking the safety of the roads. So if he's got the ability to hit the switch and spread some salt where it's slippery at noon, I don't understand why he doesn't have the ability to do it at four in the morning. Oh, that's exactly the point. I think, I think the difference is the distinction is between two in the afternoon, you would already have your guys there actually going out doing their routes. And he's a supplemental piece to snow removal, not the primary. The primary is the bargaining unit. I'm not sure I agree with that, but. I think he's an active piece of it. I think they all are. We don't have somebody that can sit on the sidelines and only come in when they're needed. We just don't have enough positions for that. All right, so if there's no further questions, um, I believe we have a certain number of days to make a decision or we can make it tonight. Can you clarify that, um, Adolfo? Uh, yes, I believe that in step three, the select board has up to 10 days. Uh, the board will hold a grieving uh, hearing uh, decision in writing. I have to issue a decision on behalf of the select board within 10 working days of this hearing. Um, and would we have to convene a separate meeting to make that decision uh, if we don't make it tonight. Correct. Yes, we would. Yeah. I... I don't know how others feel, but, to, you know, I, I would just ask the question, do we have enough on the record here this evening that uh, we would be comfortable making a decision this evening rather than having to get us all together again? Kind of asking that rhetorically, but I know how I feel. Is there anything uh, we haven't heard from Pat, Larry, or Perry? Is there anything more you would like to know about this before making a decision? I, I would like to, <clears throat> since we've heard the discussion, I would like a restatement of what their grievance is and exactly what it's based on. You want to take that one, Sean? I think a grievance is pretty well well stated in there that on the the night in question um, that the superintendent performed bargaining unit work without calling in the members of the bargaining unit on an overtime basis to perform those duties. You know, we agree that it was supplemental piece of, of it. but I believe that it's in writing that where it is and should have been called in. I mean, these guys, these guys clearly have roots that are assigned to them by the superintendent um, of plow roots and cleaning roots. Uh, the superintendent does not have a assigned route. He oversees and supplements during snow removal process. And again, it's not part of the grievance, but 
301C clearly talks about uh, inclement weather uh, during November through April for snow removal for the town to be able to adjust members of the bargaining unit schedule in order to be able to come in to deal with snow removal. But you're not disagreeing that the superintendent's job is to go out and do the inspections and to do to look at safety concerns and issues and address them. Um, I'm not going to stipulate to that because we are going to have a conversation at some point with the town manager about the safety checks. Um, so I'm I'm not willing to stipulate to that at this point. Anybody else have any further information they need to make a decision? Yeah, Trina, I just have a, a question or two. One, one is, I'm, I'm not clear what the union's response is to, um, to what was pointed out by Adolfo, that the contract says that the need to schedule overtime shall be determined by management. Uh, to me, that seems to imply that if the superintendent um, doesn't think that overtime is necessary, that that's his decision. And, um, so I'd love to hear a response to that. I 150% agree with you, but that does not mean that the superintendent can come in and perform bargaining unit work without calling them in. And then my other question is, um, Um, I heard earlier <clears throat> the union seemed to say that it's okay if the superintendent does this sort of work during normal hours um, if everybody is already busy doing their routes and they need more help. But it would seem to me that the same reasoning ought to apply that he shouldn't be able to do it then either because if he didn't do that work at that point, then someone else would need to do it. And if they were busy all day, then that work would put them into overtime. But it seems like people have agreed that it's okay for him to do it during the day when needed. So it seems like it ought to be okay for him to do it at other times as well. Again, this is, you know, he's being a supplement when all the guys are busy. You're correct that, yeah, if he didn't do it, and I'm sure there's been cases of that where he hasn't done it and guys have stayed over to perform those duties after the storm. Again, this isn't an everyday occurrence that um, that he's out having a route. This, it's different if he actually had a route that was doing it every single day because then it would be considered shared work. This is not considered shared work. He's supplemental after the guys are already out in their routes. So if, if I may, what, what is the, um, the bargaining unit's response to um, the concern that uh, Chair Broussard raised earlier? Um, from, what, from what she said, uh, it, takes, it can take 60 to 90 minutes for someone to be called in to deal with snowy or icy or unsafe road conditions. Um, and if the supervisor is out doing his job and determining what the road conditions are and makes the snap judgment that these roads need to be dealt with now um, in the interest of public safety, that seems like a perfectly reasonable decision for him to make. Um, and I, I, I can't speak for him. He's not here, I don't believe, but um, it, it seems like he made a reasonable judgment that night in December that uh, Main Street needed to be dealt with. Uh, and I, I, I can't see how that's, um, you know, not a valid decision. I, I don't know where the hour and a half comes from. Um, I know in the in the contract, there's references to 30 minutes and a time frame for them to be able to respond in. Okay. Uh, there's also pieces of in there that the 
uh, town can place the highway department on call um, if they know there's a storm coming. Um, so there is pieces in there that are clearly stated to be able to have people on call. So if it needs to be that they need to respond within a certain period of time to be able to address those types of things. Yeah. If I may, um, during the grievance interview with the highway superintendent, I know it doesn't state in this grievance, he admitted to going to Chelsea Mountain Road first and salting from the bottom to the top. Then he proceeded to come to Randolph Village after doing that to do Main Street and Central Street. And whose route is is that is that road on normally? Well, Tom, uh, Tom uh, before yeah. before we proceed from that, I, I I think the select board has kept its questions and the answers that have been provided to a very specific item okay. that we can point to that's based on fact. Right. I think at this point um, there is a a statement that has been made that we cannot confirm at this point okay. uh, since our highway Thank superintendent you. is on I agree. Call. No, I, I hear you. So I, I'd let, I just want to clarify, um, the union is, is saying that they're, they're basing this grievance on section 402 part C, that particular sentence, is that correct? Part F. I'm sorry? Part F, 402F. 402F. Three hundred one C. I might have confused you. Three hundred one C just talks about letting the um, letting them change the hours during inclement weather between um, November first and April, or November to April. I don't know the exact dates off the top of my head. So the three hundred one C is where we allow them to work four day weeks in the summertime and they come back to five day weeks to handle the winter conditions. Is that correct, Sean? Uh, that's the, the whole section, but C talks about the township have a right on a voluntary basis only to alter work schedules and shifts as necessary from November 1st to April 1st to address issues related to inclement weather. Okay. And so do, you know, I think it's hard for us to entertain that because we don't have anything that was presented in the grievance talking about it was a storm they knew was coming or what the decision was, you know, where the union feels we should have put everybody on call because of a big event. You know, we have a big nor'easter coming in, probably going to put people on call. Um, we have flash freezing that nobody knew about, probably not going to have anybody on call. But I, you know, we don't have information to weigh into this. So what we're stuck looking at is this overtime section of the contract and whether or not what took place by the highway superintendent fits in his job description. So it was a duty we, he has done in the past or prior superintendents have done in the past or whether he went rogue and it's something he should, you know, shouldn't have been doing or had been expected. To. And to reiterate what, to, to repeat what Adolfo said earlier, 402B reads, the need to schedule overtime shall be determined by management. Um, so that seems to have applied in this case. That's, that's how I'm reading it, that there was no need to have someone come in for overtime because this was done in the course of the supervisor doing his ordinary, um, his ordinary work. Um, it seems to me that part F, that the, the, at least the, the spirit of F is really about not bringing in people outside the department to do this kind of work. Um, that's that would be my interpretation of why that section is is there. Um, 
that, that this is a, not that kind of situation. That no overtime work was, was necessary. So this doesn't come into effect. The supervisor wasn't getting overtime for this work. <clears throat> it wasn't like he got overtime when someone else didn't, right? That's correct. Yeah. If he had been out and determined that we had a widespread problem around town that he couldn't handle himself, then I can see that it would have triggered an overtime call to the bargaining unit. But it seems, based on the record, that he made the decision to plow that section of Main Street that's under question here. Um, and, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, it just seems like he was performing in, in, in under the regular um, umbrella of his, of his job description. And we see right. to man we see to management in the contract that um, the right to make that determination. Do we need any more? Do we have any more questions? Any more information we need? Anybody ready to make a motion? Do we want to take the full ten days for this? What's the pleasure? Um, I'd like to move that we deny the grievance. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. So, um, I believe at this point, um, we'll work with Adolfo on the written decision and have it uh, out to folks in the 10 day time period. Um, so at this point, a uh, motion to adjourn the grievance hearing. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Being motion carries. Call to order the Board of Liquor Control. And first up is uh, public comment on the Liquor Control Board. <coughs> and nobody jumping up to talk about liquor. <laughs> um, approval of the agenda for that board. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, new business, we have uh, first class and second class liquor license and an outside consumption request. Want to take them as one? Sure. sure. Entertain a motion to approve. Uh, move that we approve uh, the, the, the group of licenses before us. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Sure you need Aye. to Aye. Yeah. Um, I, I just need to be sure that at least one select board member comes in to sign those liquor licenses so they can be processed, please. Yep, we will get a body in there. Thank I you. Actually, my best in time, I can make a guest appearance tomorrow. All right, thank you. <laughs> just don't go like all shocked on me. So I don't make it to the big city very often. There's a lot to sign. Bring extra pens. <clears throat> I gotta bring my own pen. 
<laughs> Maybe I can't make some sounds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up is a select board agenda. We'll call that one to order. And first up is public comment. This is anything that's not on our select board agenda. Hey, if I may make one public comment. Um, mm -hmm. I just uh, wanted to point uh, to the select board um, and wanted to recognize to everyone that this is um, uh, Joyce Mazuko's last meeting as the treasurer clerk for the town um, after nearly three decades of um, service to the Randolph community. Uh, this is the uh, final uh, official participation of Joyce as town uh, clerk and town treasurer at a select board meeting. So. Just wanted to uh, recognize her for her efforts and for all that she's done and just to remind the select board of her, of her pending retirement. Bravo. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Joyce. Definitely jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you. you enjoy retirement, Joyce. Um, I'm sticking around. I don't have any real plans for much, so... I'll be around. Good. Well, it's well deserved for sure. Sweet. Well, thanks for bringing that up. Sure. I did toy with the idea of not bringing it up with the <laughs> thought that maybe if I didn't bring it up, Joyce would not retire, but she said that <laughs> retirement is foregone conclusion. It's happening. So. <laughs> And we also have the opportunity to call a special meeting just to make sure this isn't our last. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> We're through our cases, huh? <laughs> we can't get together and have a big party, though, because I think everybody needs a reason for a party. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Those multi-household gatherings. <laughs> yeah. Can't have them right now. Well, if we each considered the other a safe household, right, we could gather in close proximity, but not like super close, right? Yeah, because yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, too much creative thinking on bureaucratic rules. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the select board agenda. If I, if I may make one request to the board. If, if the board would consider adding the certificate of highway mileage to the agenda under new business. Sure. Thank you. Since we gotta get it in, we probably ought to add it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so entertain a motion for approval of the agenda with the amendment. So move. Uh, you beat me, Gar. You beat me, Perry. Sorry. I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, first up is consent calendar, meeting minutes, cemetery plots, and events. I have a comment on the minutes of January 14th. Yep. Uh, page two, where I made the motion about. Um, not accepting any of the architectural assessments. It should say Pat French moved to reject all bids because they were all um, significantly above the budgeted amount. There was a reason in there why we rejected all the bids. Okay. Move to approve the consent calendar with that change. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. New business. Uh, first up is financial institution bid selection. Um, so there was an action item sheet on that to talk about the bids. Uh, maybe Joyce could explain the financial institution selected. Sure. Um, on January 8th, um, 
we submitted a request for a proposal to a number of banks. Um, the reason for the proposal is we've been with Citizens Bank or some version of Citizens Bank since about um, 1998, 1999. Um, so we've been with them a very long time, um, but um, the, we are not earning much interest on the money that we have there. Um, so with uh, Cliff, um, we drafted up a proposal to send to the banks um, seeking uh, bids for um, banking services for the town, offering um, different types of services like um, the insured uh, cash uh, accounts where there's a sweep account and it moves money um, into an interest bearing account overnight. Um, and also um, offering other types of services um, within, within the, the, the proposal. Um, so we received, I believe we received six or seven um, responses to our RFP. Um, Cliff and I um, and Emery looked over the different proposals um, and based on uh, the rate of interest that we are likely to receive and whether or not there were fees that would be charged related um, to the um, banking services um, and also based on um, past experience with uh, the particular financial institution um, we recommend that we go with the bid from uh, Mascoma Bank. Joyce, can you just, um, it said checking account. Is that the day-to-day -day checking account of the town? And if, what I'm trying to understand is what that adds for complexity for like depositing checks the town receives. If it's not a town, you know, it's not, they don't have an office in Randolph. Right. Um, they included in the proposal was to have um, remote capture deposits. So even though they don't have a, a branch here in Randolph, um, they would provide us or we would have to purchase, I can't remember which in this case, um, but uh, we would have a scanner where we would scan the checks on a daily pace, on a daily basis to be deposited each day. Um, and then we would deposit cash transactions at a local bank um, so that the cash is always being deposited um, and the, there's no cash sitting here in the office. Um, so, um, so that was part of the, the, the proposal that um, each bank provides to us was um, whatever costs there may be related to using remote deposit capture um, and um, for also um, using online banking and uh, the uh, ACH transfer of funds to different banks and whatnot. Um, and based on our analysis of the different fee structures and, and information that each bank provided to us. Um, Mascoma um, gave us, I think, the best um, offer. I don't know if Cliff has anything additional to add to that. Well, I concur. <clears throat> excuse me. I concur with Joyce. Um, the we've got the bulk of our funds sitting in a money market account now at. Um, insured money market account at um, Muscoma because they're offering the best rates and have been for since I joined the town. Um, and this would simplify our banking in terms of linking our accounts um, so that the money can be swept out to the sweep account each night at the end of the day. Um, so we would maximize our interest with very little effort on the part of town staff. And, and the remote capture we've been doing for a long time 
Um, our current bank, I think the remote captures go down to Rutland. Is that right, Joyce? Yeah. So they're processed out of Rutland. Uh, Muscoma does have a, a branch down in Bethel, which was one of the considerations that we made as well. So Cliff, uh, with the sweep account structure, uh, is that an automatic sweep both ways or just an automatic sweep one way? So how? It's an automatic sweep both ways. Um, we, we would have a target balance of $50,000 in our checking account at Muscoma um, as funds are needed in that account to cover out cover checks that we've written. Um, funds will be swept from our um, insured cash sweep account over into the checking to cover those checks. As we deposit funds, those, those um, funds in excess of 50,000 are um, automatically swept the other way to earn maximum interest on the funds. Thank you. So we'll never bounce a check. <laughs> not, not unless we're seriously shy of funds. <laughs> <laughs> which we are, which we are currently not in any, anywhere near close to that. That's some serious overdraft protection there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any questions from anybody on the board? Anyone else? Hearing none, any motions to approve? I'll move, do we approve? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Agreement request for LED Dynamics and GM EDC. Uh, yes, we were approached um, by Norwich Solar, which is a, a, a local solar panel installation firm that is currently working with the Greenmont Economic Development Corporation and um, uh, LED Dynamic. Uh, they are looking to install solar panels on the building on Beanville Road. Um, because the town is a lien holder, or I'm sorry, a mortgage holder because of the grant that was issued by the state through the town to Greenmont Economic Development Corporation, any changes that occur on the facility uh, have to receive the approval of the town. Uh, and this agreement uh, that was proposed by Norwich Solar was reviewed by the town's attorney, was uh, created after the fact uh, in, in collaboration with our town attorney. Um, and our town attorney feels that these are very standard agreements uh, in the type of relationship that the town is in with our two other partners. Uh, if, if the board would like, we do have a representative from Norwich Solar on the call that can provide more specific detail about the project that's being proposed. Um, just an uh, interesting connection I just made on this. Uh, I need to recuse myself on this one because I just signed a purchase and sales agreement with Norwich Solar. So if Larry could take this one, that would be awesome. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't have any questions. Does, do any other board members have a question for the representative from Norwich Solar? I don't have any. No, I don't. I, I have a couple. How many kilowatts is it, Brendan? So about 200. And it's, it's and uh, about 200. Right. And the reason for this agreement is because you will basically control that space on the roof for a certain amount of years. Right. It's primarily an agreement between lenders. So uh, the, uh, I, the colloquial general common sense description is um, this document says that uh, if for whatever reason um, the landlord in this case uh, or the holder of the debt wants uh, has their tenant defaults um, they want to have clear 
uh, access to their asset. And, and they just want to make sure that this, the solar tenant, will not get in between their access to their asset. So that's the subordination, the, the, the solar tenant, or it could be any other tenant on a property, uh, agrees to subordinate themselves um, in, the, in that event. Um, the non-disturbance is the kind of um, handshake in the other direction that says, look, if, um, if the lender is going to foreclose on the property because the, uh, the building tenant is, is not paying their bills, mm -hmm. um, the, the other tenant, the solar tenant, gets to stay there, right? They're, they're not in default. And so the, um, they get to be non-disturbed. And then the atonement aspect says that the solar tenant agrees in advance to a new landlord. So if, if uh, for some reason there's a default and either the lender becomes the landlord or the lender um, uh, uh, kind of sells the asset and there's a new landlord, the solar agrees in advance uh, to the new landlord. So that's, uh, it's an agreement between lenders. And how many years is the contract for the space? Uh, the lease is for 25 years. To be renewable? Mm -hmm. I believe there's a, well, I'm not sure if there's a renewable, a, a renewal clause in there specifically or not. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll make the motion to approve um, this agreement. Allowing the town manager to sign, correct? Yes. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Back thanks for time. Thank you. You're back on, Trini. <laughs> thanks. Just for the record, I'm standing on that boat. Yep, uh, got you down as an abstention. Thank you. Branch with Law and the Brella program. Uh, the town has been working with the regional planning, with our regional planning commission, Two Rivers, um, on identifying what may have been left. Um, on the Branchwood lot. Uh, Two Rivers Atacuichi came to the select board uh, several months ago uh, after it concluded its phase one environmental assessment and shared with the board uh, what it had found at the time. And then also briefly spoke to the select board about a potential opportunity to uh, find additional funding to perform a phase two environmental assessment. Um, at this point, Two Rivers has come to us and has shared with us that there's an opportunity to enter the Brella program, which is a state program that helps uh, owners of potential brown uh, fuel sites or brownfield sites to uh, give them access to funds that would otherwise not be available for cleaning or for expertise or consultation. Uh, Two Rivers uh, would like to recommend that the town agree to enroll the Branchwood lot or the Branchwood property into the Brilla program and has also offered to pay for uh, the application and then also pull the application together on behalf of the town. Anybody have any questions on this? Hearing none, anybody want to make a motion to pursue it? I move that we enroll the Branchwood lot parcel into the Brella program. Second. And I will second that. I think Larry Beach is done. All right. Sounds <laughs> good. <laughs> it's on you. <laughs> we have a motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 
branch uh, water allocation for Faye Sherman lots. We have on the call Chris Chambers, the water superintendent. Um, I asked him to join us for this meeting so that he can speak about the request that his department received uh, from Mr. Faye Sherman. Chris, are you there? Yeah, I'm trying. I was just having trouble getting it unmuted. Um, so this is just a follow-up. This request came in with the wastewater um, variance that was requested last month. Um, they both came at the same time and just due to an error on my part, it didn't get moved on for last month. Um, just the, it's the water allocation request for those, um, four lots that he wants to subdivide that's on the end of south pleasant street it's right across from the cemetery down there uh it's our current the state's current rate is two dollars and 65 cents per gallon for 360 gallons um totaling all four lots together to be three thousand eight hundred and sixteen dollars uh the committee recommended approval um uh out of and it passed four to zero. Chris, any questions from board members? Seeing none, anybody want to make a motion? I'll move that we approve the allocation, the water allocation for those four lots. Yeah, I'll second, second that. that. <laughs> It's time. You got to get quicker. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to be it's quiet. Like, it's, it's like playing Jeopardy. I have to punch that button. Yeah, you got to punch the button. Sounded, there, but... sounded like a tie to me. <laughs> That's close, wasn't it? Just going to coin. Not the minute. The fact we had a dueling second. <laughs> I'll, I'll include that in the minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I think we're back to you, Chris, on the water meter request for Freedom Foods. Uh, yep. Um, a couple months ago, we had requested, um, or well, Freedom Foods requested a, you know, a, a wastewater credit and a billing adjustment on a regular basis. Um, Someone made the question of a meter, which um, it had been questioned early on, but no one was sure if it could have been done. After looking at the system, they are able to put a meter in that's after the RO system. So it doesn't, there's no having to occur for any of the waste product from the RO system. Um, this, this water is strictly used in their um, goods, mostly in anything that they bottle. Um, is the larger stuff they, you know, any beverages that they make, um, and then they get shipped out of town to the retailers. Uh, we do have um, one other instance instance of this type of uh, adjustment as um, Wind River or formerly Dimmick Septic Services. They have a meter that is a water only. Um, set up that is for water that gets taken out of town um, and because they use it on their service trucks and stuff like that and so they don't get billed for the sewer portion of that. Um, any question? I mean the, the committee met on February 1st to discuss the meter. Uh, they motion passed three to zero to approve the, to recommend approval of the meter. Uh, so I guess any questions from there? I have a couple of questions, Chris. It's Pat. Um, it says here the might typically be a credit of three hundred and seventy-five dollars. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the average based on the work that Cliff and I had done um, on the batch sheets that was prevented prior to. Uh, so it's all the same water. So that's kind of where that number came from. What's their total average 
water bill? Oh, geez. They've been quite high for um, quite a while. They put in some cooling racks to, as part of the process to cool the bottles down, um, which uses an excessive amount of water. Uh, I believe their lowest in like a year was last quarter at 59 units, but that was due to, um, they didn't do much bottling that particular quarter. Um, prior to that, I'm not real familiar with their actual usages. I would have to confer with finance on that. Um, there's a possibility Nathan Bacon was from Freedom Foods was trying to be on the call. He might know what that is. I don't know if he's there or not. Yeah, Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, my, my uh, video doesn't work on my home laptop. Um, yeah, as far as the, the historical water usage goes, as, as you mentioned, we do bottling, um, and some products are required to be um, cooled down to a, a certain temperature um, rather quickly um, to avoid spoilage and, and damage to the overall product. Um, so when that was first installed, we, we had it equipped to be able to hook up to a chiller um, that would then be cooling the process water. Um, but from the outset, we couldn't do that. So it would, the means of cooling down that water for cooling the bottles was, was basically running a tap into the, the tank. Um, so that's going to go down drastically. Um, I mean, we think we were using uh, around 800 gallons a day, um, for that process when, when we were up and running, um, and that number should be going down to less than a hundred, um, with the new chiller that's going in. So. What was the average bill? Uh, Chris would have to speak that. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. I didn't, I didn't bring any documents home for this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have that information. Um, that would be a finance question. The reason, the reason I'm asking is because my memory of been, having been on the Water and Sewer Committee is that a certain amount of water that you take in does not go into the sewer system. Mm -hmm. And I seem to remember 10 or 20% that typically does not go into the sewer system for one reason or another. So I'm wondering what $375, what percentage of their total bill that is. Um, we can definitely look into that. Um, I am not entirely sure of what that number would be um i can do some some quick math I, I, a, when we're up and running our bottling line um the winter is kind of a downtime for it uh a majority of our water is going into bottles um and if i do some math here really, really quick um i can get you that number uh, times Um, it'd be anywhere from a thousand to seventeen hundred gallons a day would be going into a product, um, just based on our, our bottling throughput when we're running at capacity. What I'm asking is, the credit will be three hundred seventy-five dollars roughly. That's what we have in our information. What percentage of the total bill is that? Yeah, we'd have to get you, we don't have those numbers. Sorry, Pat. It seems like if it's within the same range as the average residence pays for anyway, even if it doesn't go down into the sewer, that's my question. It would seem like it would be unfair to give an additional break in this case. And my other question is, if we were to approve this, does that mean that anybody can do that? Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing I can say to that is if we're using 10,000 gallons or more a day going into bottles, it's substantially more than 10 to 20 percent of our water usage. And none of that goes back into the wastewater system here. I guess I guess I would 
I would say, um, Pat, I'm, I'm not aware of the current, the way the current billing works that there is an automatic allowance for a certain amount. Um, I, my understanding is that the, is that the, the sewers charges are based proportionately on the water usage. And, and that's I, I agree with that, but the engineers have told us in the past when I was on the water and sewer committee that if a hundred gallons of water come in, it's less than a hundred gallons that go out. Yeah. Yeah. You're drinking some of it, right? So. But for uh, many reasons, I guess, you know. That but, uh, in this case, there's an easy way to monitor this by hooking the reverse osmosis system up to a separate meter as I'm reading here. And, you know, there's really no way to monitor how much a homeowner is, you know, who's consuming six glasses of water a day is, yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a distinction between a commercial operation and uh, a, a residential use of the so system. In all of, in this scenario, NEP has a little bit of a similar deal, but it's not quite the same. And same for um, Wind River. Mm -hmm. They all have all these extra meters they pay for, they maintain them. Um, for the most part, they submit the readings. We do verify the readings. In their case, they want to mount the reader right next to the reader that we read. So it would be our operator would go up, read the water meter, and then they could they would have that reading sitting right there. Um, so this is, you know, other than the credit or adjustment to the wastewater bill, it's very minimal of what we do. Whereas, like a resident, it's and, mm -hmm. and the resident, it's not a consistent thing. This is like part of. This is part of how this business this business uses this water as um, trying to think of words that I want for it. Sorry, cost of goods sold. Yeah. yeah, essentially, yeah. Chris, isn't this sort of similar to um, you and I have talked about this before because we had this issue at our home. Isn't this sort of similar to the fact that a homeowner can um, can ask for a credit on their sewage bill for water to fill a swimming pool? In that a is correct. Yeah. It's, a it's a measurable amount and it's easy to measure. Um, like, you know, we don't issue the credits for, you know, topping your pool off through the summer, but if we go out, verify your pool's empty and you fill your pool up, you know, then yes, you're good. Then we right. know that right. you put that water in there. Yeah. 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 So back last month when we were talking about this, I didn't have a problem with any of this as long as there was a meter and a way to quantify it. So, you know, you know my take on this is they've done what we've asked them to do. And, you know, I think it's, it's fair. So, you know, like I said, if I decide I want to buy a water meter and install it myself and when I'm washing trucks all summer, we'll, you know, I see it the same treatment, okay? Commercial users are different than residential users. Mm -hmm. And if we're making the case for the pool or for filling a swimming pool, I don't think that's any different than last winter when I paid for water to make snow. You know, I didn't pay a sewer fee for it. I paid the water bill. Yep. Mm -hmm. That aligns with the thinking of the committee. So can I just repeat my question? Then anybody can do this that can meter their water that doesn't go down the sewer, right? Seems reasonable to me. It, it, I think we want to. We're. I think we're looking more at a commercial. Yeah, I would say commercial needs to be the key here. Yeah. And and the case of a swimming pool, you know, I think that's certainly fair. And to, to add a little bit more for the board, it, it looks like the precedent is, is not necessarily water loss within the town, but the precedent is water that is taken and then disposed of outside of the district, outside of the town boundary, as opposed to being used within the town in a different way. Mm -hmm. Chris, you mentioned two other places that do this. You said Wind River and what was the other? 
So New England Precision is in a very similar situation. Um, theirs is because of their history over time. They started out with just only getting water from us. And if you remember, they used to have that big evaporator that had a ton of steam coming off the building. Mm -hmm. um, in the last couple of years, it actually went to the board where the board ended up approving them to adopt the, be able to send us process water with a BOD surcharge. Um, that's how the wastewater plan operates. And so we charge them more money because they go above and beyond the normal um, waste load. And so, yeah, and so they are in that situation. They actually have a separate meter for the process water. They have a full-on pump station with a water meter. It's not a water meter. It's a wastewater meter with special grinders in it. It's like five to $10,000 range um that they pay for and maintain and then on top of that they have high these um special washers that evaporate water because they get the water so hot to clean the parts um it's also reverse osmosis water and that water boils off so we don't catch that and it's like 50 units a quarter in their <clears throat> instant Okay, do we have any more questions from members of the board? Hearing none, anybody else have questions? You no know, mute buttons go to unmute. Uh, anybody wanna make a motion on this? Sure. So I'd make a motion that we approve Freedom Foods for the use of a waste, for the use of an approved meter measured from the RO for water used in the production of their products. And I'll second. <laughs> Got in on that one. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. That's a, an opposed, Pat? That is an opposed, yes. OK. So that second, uh, if I may just, sorry, point of uh, clarification, that second was Larry? Tom. Yeah, was all over oh, it. Tom. Oh, Tom got in there. <laughs> Beat him to the punch. All right, motion carries. Um, next up is a sculpture agreement between the town of Randolph and Paul Coulter. Uh, we had a uh, member of the community work to uh, install a sculpture at the garden area that is maintained by uh, Rosalind over on uh, a lot owned by the town at One Elm Street. Um, the sculpture was installed several, approximately about two or three months ago before, before winter really started. Um, and throughout that process, we've been working or I've been working with the sculptor to establish an agreement on the uh, installation of the sculpture or just the fact that the town now has the sculpture. Uh, and the uh, agreement that was in your packet is what the sculptor and I have been able to come up with, which is essentially that the town owns a sculpture, but the town agrees to return the sculpture should the current home of the sculpture fall into disrepair, uh, or if there is new, no new location to install the sculpture, that is agreed to by both the town and the sculptor or the town uh, and the sculptor's heirs. Questions on the agreement? Uh, it's, um, Adolfo can attest this is an agreement with which I am intimately familiar. <laughs> Uh, having having served as the intermediary between Marjorie Ryerson and Paul and uh, the town office, and it reads perfectly, uh, it, it reads perfectly fine to me, and I think it's in keeping with Paul's um, wishes that uh, he retain some control over the fate of the sculpture in the event that the garden goes out of 
use or um, anything like that. So looks fine to me. I have one comment. I think the so when we approve this agreement, it should be put in the town records so we can always get and get a hold of it if we need it. I I could do that. I could if the board were to approve. And once we have all of the signatures, I could certainly hand it over to the clerk's office so that we could keep it on the official record. I move to approve the agreement with the uh, stipulation that it be recorded in the town records once signed. I will second that. We let you have that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I knew Tom was gonna be fast, I didn't even try. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. I was like, this is I'm so good. happy to see this one uh, off my plate. That, there you um, go. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And and thank you to Paul. Carries. Yes, thank you, Paul. And he has been um, he has been sent a thank you letter on behalf of the town and the Arts and Culture Committee as well. So nice. Next up, we have the uh, treasurer's office change in access to accounts. Um, we have, uh, as you all know, uh, Joyce has uh, brought in her successor, uh, Emery Mathias, who is also, I believe, running unopposed this year as a, a treasurer clerk. Uh, and so the, the existing treasurer clerk has brought to the board a request to include uh, Emery as um, a potential signator in all of our accounts. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I have no issue with this, but um, does that have to wait until he is officially, until Emery is officially elected to the clerk treasurer position? I would imagine the bank would have policies on that. No, um, no, he would be currently he would be added as an assistant. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, um, but by having him on the account when I when I do actually retire, then you don't have to go through the process of adding his name. He's he's already on the account. It's just a matter of change in title mm -hmm. from assistant to to being actually the treasurer. Okay, that makes sense. And Joyce. Do we have a bond for this sort of um, stuff? Everything, uh, bonding for the clerk treasurer falls under the uh, insurance that we have through VLCT. And that covers everybody? Yes. I'll move that we add Emory Mathias as an authorized signatory on all town bank accounts and the credit card. A second. You beat him. <laughs> I, I waited a moment to give him a chance too. Yeah, I, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> That's why I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Next up is a snowmobile trail access form. Uh, in your packets, uh, in the updated packets, uh, um, I did not have a time to pull together an action item sheet, but I did include a uh, snowmobile access uh, form. Uh, essentially, the way state law works is that if there is a snowmobile operator that is using a snowmobile, uh, he has to, or she has to have, or they have to have permission from every property owner uh, um, to allow them to use the trail if the trail goes through every property owner. Or um, the snowmobile operator has to be a member of a VAST approved uh, club. Because VAST is uh, insured and they extend insurance protections to property owners. Uh, some of these snowmobile trails uh, travel through town property, uh, and we currently do not have a form to provide approval to vast club members so that they can use 
uh, the trails that run through town property. So uh, if the board were to entertain the opportunity to, or the request to sign on to this form so that we can partner with VASP, the town would decrease its liability because VASP would protect the town if any VASP members have an accident on town property or something were to happen. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's, it's a good thing for us to be uh, partnered with VAST on, on this issue. So uh, uh, there are VAST trails currently going through town property, is that correct? There are actually town Over here in East yeah, there are. Yeah. Uh, well, it actually goes through the forest and on a class four uh, road. Okay, that's so, what I thought, okay. So they don't need it for the class four road, it's for the segment of the trail. That's, my gosh, mm -hmm. we went through it when we were kids. Um, yeah. But I was on a call for, on a select board meeting for another town and their attorney was recommending that they sign this and have it on record. And I think the major benefit to this is if anything ever happened, VAST has to defend the town. Mm -hmm. So if an incident happened, we wouldn't have to pay an attorney if there was a case or anything, it would all be under VAST and their responsibility. So we are covered by the recreation law out there from liability, but what this gives us is somebody else happened to fight the case instead mm -hmm. of us having for it. That makes total sense. Yeah. And this is, Trini, this is only for trails? It's only trails that are part of the statewide trail system. So what happens is you have a local club, and in this case, it's the Middle Valley Polar Bears that are over here in East Randolph, and they go out and establish the trails and maintain them. Uh, they just dumped a sizable chunk of change into this one, um, and they, they do all the grooming and all the maintenance, and, and they're used by cross-country skiers, and um, I see dog sledders have been added to this, but um, sometimes folks are out just walking them even. So uh, there are other users than just the snowmobilers, but um, it is the snowmobile group that does the maintenance and the upkeep of them. I didn't get a copy of the form. Did everybody else? It was in the last packet, the last packet. that Adolfo sent us oh. just earlier today. I went through it looked all the other one today. Maybe I yeah. yeah, I got it. It's last packet. And presumably we would grant permission for all three activities, right? Snowmobiling, cross country, and dog sledding. I mean, there's no reason why we would preclude any of those, is there? No. No. In the past, I mean, in the past, yeah. Well, in the past, what had always happened was when this is all established, the local clubs would go to the select board to ask for the use to travel like on a road or through, like in this particular case where Trini's talking about is through the town forest, but wasn't that, that was an old class four road. So. Mm -hmm. so part of it is on class four period. Right. Part of it part is of actually it is, right. trail they yes. back in the 80s. Right. So now, you know, with liability, the situation the way it is, you know, it's just another layer of protection. I'm sure you've all heard about the snowmobile that burned down the covered bridge. Maybe or maybe not. <laughs> I'm not sure, sure where it was, and I'm not sure if it was a vast trail, but you know, snowmobile caught fire in a bridge somehow, burned a covered bridge down. It'll be interesting Boy. to see how that shakes out. But it was in Troy, Vermont. Was it? Um, I figured you yeah, might know. And the uh, rider actually had coverage, so their insurance company is probably going, "Oh no!" Somebody <laughs> buying a covered bridge. <laughs> uh, just put uh, a half a million dollars into rehabbing the bridge too. that's going to so, show up in a century insurance ad one of these days on tv you like whatever it is there you know state the, what, the farm family one or something yeah we cover that <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, no, it, it's a it's a it's a good policy to do yeah. so i'll um I'll move that we ad adopt the landowner permission form of VAST for uh, all trails moving through town properties. I'll second it. Um, so we have to designate somebody to sign it. Oh yeah, it could be Adolfo. 
You good with that, Tom? Yeah, I'm fine with that. We'll, we'll okay. Authorize Adolfo's, the town manager, to sign it. We have a motion on the table. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carried. Uh, next up is the B Trans mileage certificate. Uh, yes, this is uh, an annual certification process that the towns have to participate in. Uh, we have not had any changes in our mileage since the road reclassification process of over a year ago. Uh, the board would just have to um, accept the form as is and authorize, uh, well, actually, I believe it requires a signature of a board member. Uh, and once we have a board member signature, we could resubmit, um, but we just, just so everybody knows, we are resubmitting a form with no changes, just confirming our existing road mileage. Sounds like you need to bring another pen, Jimmy. <laughs> hmm. the pile up. Filing fine right now is another highlighter, so I got to dig deeper. <laughs> uh, Any questions on the certification form? Any motions? Sure, I make a motion to approve the uh, certification high highway mileage for the year ending February 10th, 2021. I'll second that one. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Stained. Motion carries. Next up is uh, Better Connections Downtown Master Plan. We have Josh, our economic development director, on the call, and he's been taking the lead on uh, this particular project and a few others. Um, so, uh, Josh, you ready? Yeah, um, the Better Connections grant um, is a grant through VTrans and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, it's a it's a two year cycle, um, and they don't. Uh, the pool of funds is only about 200,000. So they only anticipate awarding uh, two or three grants um, each cycle. Um, and these funds are intended um, to um, be used for planning purposes um, like uh, a master plan, uh, downtown master plan. So um, the, the planning commission um, earlier this month or, or maybe it was, um, late January discussed this um, and voted to move forward with an application. Uh, and I've been working with Julie Eiflin from RECDC um, to review the materials um, and to um, start to put together uh, the application. Um, we have a, a, a sort of a, a description, project description um, that we're sort of loosely basing it off from um, and uh, uh, tentative project scope um, right now, which uh, because it's a downtown master plan, uh, we're looking at it as sort of like a hub and spoke kind of uh, scope where the core of the, of the focus area is the designated downtown, the downtown area. Um, the neighborhoods around uh, the downtown um, with um, uh, transportation corridors um, leading to the south, um, down past Shaw's, possibly to the Beanville Road um, intersection, um, and then northward um, up towards uh, the reservoir um, and, and surrounding neighborhoods up there. Um, and the goal is to identify, uh, the, the goal is um, to do uh, a robust community engagement process. Um, these, these grant periods are 18 months. Um, and so this, this project would, would take up a, a good chunk of those 18 months. Um, and it would be based on a robust community engagement um, to get feedback um, around a series of um, topics uh, like pedestrian bicycle traffic, um, vehicular traffic, um, the use of parking lots. Um, it would look at uh, underutilized parcels 
um, in the focus area um, and, you know, potential redevelopment uses um, for them. Um, it would look at beautification components um, of the scope area. So there might be conversations about places to have pocket parks um, or additional recreational um, places um, that the uh, that can be installed. Um, and, and then another component, um, which would be, how do we safely connect the um, trail systems, recreational trail systems that we have on the outside of the village um, to safely connect them to the downtown? Uh, that has been something that has been talked about um, that I've heard in the community and something that builds off from the, the good work that's already been done uh, with Rasta um, and, and the gear house um, in that sector. Um, so um, those would be sort of like some of the focus areas, you know, uh, focusing on multimodal transportation um, and the revitalization of uh, blighted properties, um, underutilized parcels. Um, and the final piece would be sort of like a, a marketing analysis. So typically these master plans will have a, a baseline economic um, data and it will look at some market trends um, and help provide us with some tools that we could use to look at new branding initiatives, um, and uh, new messaging. Um, and this, this sort of work, this plan um, would really be used by a lot of the, the town and a lot of the organizations um, in the community to, to show potential funders um, that there's, a, there's been a robust community process um, when they're seeking funding for um, their programs. So um, it, would inv it would involve uh, a steering committee. Um, and typically a steering committee would be comprised of, you know, maybe one or two select board members, one or two uh, planning commission members, maybe a, a, an individual from Two Rivers. Um, they always include uh, an individual from ACCD um, and VTRANS, the two, two individuals who run this program. Um, and maybe a couple other individuals. Um, and then I would anticipate um, maybe some subcommittees um, when they're doing ad hoc work uh, throughout the project. Um, and of course, the community engagement piece um, takes a lot of um, effort. Um, and certainly, you know, during COVID, it would be a little different. Um, but I know that uh, um, these happened um, over the last couple of years and there was um, one of them uh, fairly was awarded one in 2019 um, and they did community engagement work um, last year um, to do to implement some of the some of the pilot tests that were identified in, in that process. So I think it's something that uh, I don't think Randolph has ever engaged in. Um, before uh, and, and would be uh, some, some really good material to help um, with economic development efforts for the next 10 years. Great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah. Anybody have any questions on this effort? I have a couple. Um, would this look at the possibility of expanding the de downtown designated area? if that was advisable? Um, I don't think that would be something that would be looked at. I mean, it's, I guess it's possible, it's, I guess it's possible, but um, I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure if that would be a huge component of it. It could be part of the process. So if people felt it needed to be. I guess that people felt that there was a need to expand it because there were economic benefits to doing it, um, then I, I, I guess so. But 
um, all of the the master plans that I've seen, I've not seen that sort of um, sort of piece in it, but totally not out of the realm of looking at. And the product would be a written report or? It would be a written report. Um, they vary, f you know, in size, you know, um, Fairleys, or uh, I should say, um, you know, Virgin's master plan, you know, might be 60, 70 pages. Um, Chester's master plan, I think was 150. So I think it, I think it varies on the consultants that are utilized for the project. I think getting public input like this is a great idea. Well, that's the main, that's one of the main goals um, of the program because um, you need to have robust community engagement. It's expected. Um, and that's why the value of the plan is so great um, when you're, when you're showing it to funders because it's been based on deep community engagement and reflects the will of uh, community members through a, yeah. a, a, you know, a very long um, and thoughtful process. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? If not, a motion. Trini, can I say something It's Heidi? Yeah, go ahead, Heidi. Um, I just want to say, too, that I hope that the Recreation Department and the committee is also in kind of involved. I know in Farley, uh, the Rec Commission was greatly involved in that kind of master plan. Um, so definitely, that's our committee is also working a lot of signage and stuff to mm -hmm. with our parks. So yeah, uh, absolutely. I just want to remind that. Yeah, no, it was, ex it, it, I mean, I... Filling out some of the forms today, I, I put down the Randolph Rec Committee as one of the stakeholders. So um, we fully anticipate that they would be involved uh, in the community engagement process. Thank you. I just didn't hear it. So that's why I just wanted to remind it. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Motions. I'll move that we grant approval for better conditions downtown master plan grant application. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next down, uh, downtown transportation designated downtown program. Uh, yeah, I'll admit uh, Josh and I had spoken earlier about uh, identifying some projects within the capital improvement plan that would work um, for this project. We have not been able to, mostly on my part, not having had the time to reach out to Josh. Um, there are several meetings that are coming up um, of the select board special meetings and also the um, reorganization meeting early next month. Uh, if the board would prefer, since we, we do not have a project specifically to present to the board today, we could start working on a project, uh, start working potentially on an application in the hopes that the board authorizes us to apply um, at any one of the upcoming special meetings or even the reorganization meeting. Uh, the deadline for the application is March 8th. So it's three days or so before the normal March meeting, but it is after the organi reorganization meeting. So there are opportunities where we can present the project to the board. Okay. Anybody have any? Any more they need to know on that? That's how we got the money from Merchants Row, right? That's right. Yeah, it's the same pot of money. We're able to have two grants at the same time. So um, we anticipate completing Merchants Row and Pleasant Street. Pleasant Street's already done. Uh, we anticipate completing Merchants Row before 
um, May, really, depending on the thawing of the ground. Uh, so we are able to have two of these grants out at the same time. Alpha, is this different than the than the bike ped grant that came to our attention recently? It is a different grant. Um, I have not had a time to look up the requirements for that other grant, but it is two separate grants. One is um, a grant that we can use at any part of the state, but the, this particular grant, um, the down the the downtown transportation grant is specifically only for the designated downtown. Okay. Well, the person who administers the bike ped grant seemed to think that we should consider applying for that one. Uh, we we can't, yeah, we, yeah. If we, I'd have to, I, I don't, yeah. I just, uh, I, have, I didn't look at the grant and I don't know what we have that would apply for it, but Josh and I can put our heads together and at one of the upcoming special meetings, we could potentially propose a project. Okay, I, I also have some ideas we might use that grant money for. Okay. Okay, good. Libraries transforming communities. This was a request made by Kimball Library they identified this grant that would uh, potentially award them $3,000 to, um, to create and host community engagement projects. Um, I, I don't believe they have the projects yet, but would use the grant to help create some of the community engagement projects. So they could help Josh. <laughs> yeah, 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 they could. <laughs> Is <laughs> any questions on the grant? Seeing none, <laughs> any motions? I'll move to approve the library's transforming communities grant application from Kimball Library. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Old business. Uh, none to share today. Other business. Um, I just have a question on behalf of the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee, to which I'm the liaison. Um, uh, and that is at the reorganization meeting, uh, I'm presuming that the nine people who want to step forward and continue serving on it need to be reappointed for a year. Is that correct? That's correct, Tom. Okay. And we have had a change in leadership. I've stepped down as chair of that committee and I'm just serving as the select board liaison and Susanna Gravel has come back on the committee uh, after taking about a 10 month um, a break and she's now chairing the committee. So. I will at their meeting the uh, Monday before the reorganization meeting. So if I ask them to submit a list of nine uh, candidates for appointment for the next year, will that be timely enough? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'll do then. Um, they also, uh, usually folks send in their own request. But well, they do. Um, it can go either way. But the reason why we got everybody all as one was because we created that committee new. Right. Is there any problem with them, with the committee just submitting a list of nine people then? I mean, um, there isn't, but we should still also add it out there in case there's somebody you're not capturing. Okay. Right. So there may be somebody in the, in the, you know, out there that's got an interest that that committee isn't aware of. And how should we go about, how should the committee go about soliciting those interests? Just a public notice on the website or front I porch believe, forum? Uh, that's something that the town does. Oh, okay. Well, there is it, one opening right now um, because uh, Abby Tonks from Huggable Mug has stepped off and 
because I stepped off as chair that enabled uh, Susanna to come back on, but there is one opening. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't know, Adolfo, how you want to handle that in terms of how we notice it, but. Um, yeah, let, let me know. Uh, I, well, you and I can maybe talk tomorrow about that position. I know there are other vacancies and other committees and. Right. Um, this is roughly about the time when we start reminding the town that we have vacancies and we have committees and any interest yeah. to reach out to us. And then the only other question I had is what's the status of the town report? Is that at the printer? It is. We approved the final proof um, and the report should currently be, be, be in the process of being printed. Now, how are we going to distribute that this year? By the same me methods as always, you pick it up at town hall or? We typically distribute to different locations, the general right. stores, uh, the bowling alley. We do have some here at Town Hall. Library, presumably. Yeah, yeah. we play some where people typically do congregate. Right. Or I guess they, they can't congregate now, but we'll go to. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if it was going to be changed by COVID or anything like that, but it sounds fairly straightforward. Yeah. Great. Any other other business manager's report? Uh, I just have a few a few items. One is I've been working with um, the Chandler Center for the Arts. They informed me that they're looking to upgrade their internet service. Um, we have two free internet connections because of our partnership with EC Fiber because they installed the, one of their servers here at Town Hall. Um, our existing facilities already have the internet capacity that they need. The only other location that we could have installed this second free service is at the village fire station. Um, and they've told, they've told us that they like what they have and it's a direct connection. They would prefer not to have it. So, uh, I've been working with Chandler on potentially because they are already looking to upgrade potentially, um, seeing if this service would work for them so it could continued partnership with the town, decrease their costs, uh, roughly at a savings of you know $2,000 for a year, but still another way for us to partner with them and, and they can work with us. So that's still a conversation that's happening. It's uh, certainly not final until we bring it to the board. Uh, I will soon start to work on scheduling public meetings for the residents on Highland Avenue and Maple Street to share with them the proposed detour uh, time frame for when the culvert on Beanville Road is going to you know, be replaced. Uh, when I have those potential dates out, a uh, few weeks out, I'll, I'll share them with the board through email so that you know of those dates and we can find a way to invite everyone on those roads so that they know that a detour is going to have to cut through their road for roughly about three weeks to four tops. Uh, and then the last item is that um, I have not received a response from the International Union of Public Employees regarding uh, our response to their request. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if they will respond to our request, but um, we, have, we have not received one yet. And that is all I have for the manager's report for this week. Adolfo, I have a question. Uh, we talked a couple, several times about asking the Northfield Savings Bank people who are investing our money in to talk to us after having done that now for what, almost two years. Could we do that? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I, I forgot about that request. Uh, yes, um, we can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Anything else in uh, manager's report? No, that, that is everything. Great. Uh, seeing no reason for executive session, motion to adjourn. So we adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be my task. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should just make it permanent. Uh. The official <laughs> secondary. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah. It's assuming you're assuming I, I want to second everything. You know? <laughs> you're, you're kind of a go along kind of guy, right? You, well, you know, I try to be. I'm not sure that. Uh, It'll work. Yeah. I'm not sure that. <laughs> the, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll let it go at that. I was going to say, there might, have, there might have been some people here earlier this evening that don't see me that way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No takers on the opposition? Motion carries. Whew. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. I know.